It's time for Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, inviting the atheist, agnostic, and skeptic to examine for themselves the evidence for the Christian faith. We are all limited by what we do not know and by the things we think we know but are not true. Dr. Joe Mott earned his Ph.D. at LSU and was a distinguished math professor at Florida State University for 38 years, helping to write three math textbooks and authoring over 30 research articles in math. He is now the host of this radio program, Defending and Commending the Faith. Here is Joe Mott. Hello to everyone. Welcome to the program. In the Battle of Waterloo, there was one position which was taken and retaken three times during that memorable day. Both Napoleon and Wellington realized the strategic importance of that position and concentrated their attention upon it. Its ultimate possession by the British troops secured the final victory. In the same way, in Christianity, there is one point which from the first has been understood to be absolutely vital, namely the event of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Opponents of Christianity have always concentrated their attacks, and Christians have centered their defense upon the resurrection. Everyone realizes that the resurrection is a vital, fundamental, and essential claim. If this point is uncertain, then everything else regarding Christianity is also uncertain. If the resurrection is safe and secure, then all claimed by Christianity is safe and secure. Therefore, it is of utmost importance that we should consider the description of the resurrection as it appears in the four Gospels within the rest of the New Testament. In the last episode, we were discussing William Lane Craig's argument for the historicity of the resurrection. He says the evidence for the resurrection can be grouped under four broad factual headings. Fact one is that after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the personal tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. If the burial site was known to the Jewish leadership, Roman soldiers and Christians alike, then when Jesus' disciples began to proclaim the resurrection in Jerusalem, the body of Jesus must have been missing from the tomb. It would have been impossible to proclaim the truth of the resurrection if everyone knew that the body still lay interred in the tomb. Fact two is that on the first Easter Sunday morning following the crucifixion, the tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Our confidence of the empty tomb is further increased by the instant response of the Jewish religious authorities. They promoted the theft hypothesis, saying that Jesus' followers had stolen the body. Consequently, they were inadvertently admitting that the tomb was empty, corroborating the one outstanding fact about the crucifixion and resurrection, namely the fact of the empty tomb and the disappearance of the body of Jesus. That fact is still a question that must be explained. Today I continue Craig's argument. I begin with fact three, that on various occasions and under different circumstances, different people and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. The epistle, 1 Corinthians, was written about 53 to 57 A.D. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8, the Apostle Paul provides a list of eyewitnesses of the resurrection. First, to Peter. Second, the disciples without Judas and Thomas. Third, 
over 500 brethren at once. The greater part remained to the time of writing. Fourth, James, the former skeptical brother of Jesus, who became an elder and pillar in the Jerusalem Christian Church. Fifth, all the disciples. Sixth, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8, quotes, Last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time, end quotes. That surely refers to his experience on the road to D Damascus. I call attention to the writings of Paul regarding the resurrection. First Thessalonians is generally considered to be the earliest epistle of Paul. It was written in the year 50 to 51 AD. It relates that Jesus Christ was killed in chapter 2 verse 15 and chapter 4 verse 14 and was raised from the dead in chapter 4 verse 14. It also attributes to Jesus the functions of God in relation to men. That's in first chapter, verse 1 and 6, and in the third chapter, verse 11. The Apostle Paul began his letter to the Romans, typically dated in the early 50s AD, by proclaiming that Jesus is the resurrected Son of God, that's in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Just 17 to 18 years after the crucifixion, Jesus was described as divine. That is too short of a period of time to be considered a legend or a myth. Now let's look at the 12 recorded appearances of the resurrected Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus appeared not just once, but many times. Not to just one person, but to different persons. Not to one individual, but to groups of people. Not to just one locale and one set of circumstances, but at various locales and under different sets of circumstances. Not just to believers, but to unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. The radical critic Gerd Ludemann is the author of the 2004 skeptical book, The Resurrection of Christ, A Historical Inquiry. Ludemann was a professor of New Testament at Gerdigen University in Germany, who for a number of years split his time between Gerdigen and Vanderbilt Divinity School in Nashville, Tennessee. He denies the resurrection of Jesus, but he admits, quotes, it is historically certain that Peter and other disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quotes. Fact four. Craig writes, the earliest disciples came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. First, Judaism had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. Secondly, according to Old Testament law, anyone who was executed on a tree was thereby shown to be a heretic, and consequently, under the curse of God. Thirdly, the Jewish belief had no expectation of anyone rising from the dead except for the universal event on Judgment Day at the end of the age. And in particular, Jews did not believe in an individual event of resurrection within history. First, let's think of the situation the disciples faced immediately following his cruel crucifixion. Now their leader was dead. His followers were obviously devastated and demoralized, having their hopes severely dashed that Jesus had been sent by God as Israel's Messiah and the deliverer from Roman oppression. Now, after the crucifixion, fearing for their lives, the disciples had lost all hope 
They desperately searched for a place of refuge because they anticipated it would be them next in line to be crucified. Secondly, observe that it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. On the day of the crucifixion, they were filled with sadness, but on the first day of the week, with gladness. At the crucifixion, they were hopeless. On the first day of the week, their hearts were afire with hope and certainty. By Sunday, these disciples undisputedly came to believe that Jesus was, in fact, raised from the dead. They were so completely convinced that they were willing to go to their deaths for their belief. Even the Pharisee, Paul, who had persecuted the people of the way, along with James, the skeptical brother of Jesus, both suddenly became followers of Christ after his appearance to them. But then matters dramatically changed. After the resurrection, the disciples were transformed from fearful to fearless, from hiding in silence to public proclaimers of this specific message. Jesus was the Messiah of God who died on the cross for the sins of the world, was buried, was resurrected from the dead, and was seen alive by the disciples and many other eyewitnesses. The mere removal of the body from the tomb could never have transformed them what could account for the astonishing change for those disciples in such a short time? William Lane Craig's four facts of the resurrection cry out for an explanation. What is your explanation? All this was done in an observable way. There is a wealth of solid evidence that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Here is an overview encapsulated in seven facts characterized by words that start with the letter E. First, Jesus was executed by experts in killing. Second, the tomb was empty. Third, Jesus was seen alive by more than 500 eyewitnesses on 12 different occasions after the crucifixion over a period of 40 days. And that gives the most outstanding proof that Jesus rose from the dead. During that time, he conversed with his disciples, ate food with them, allowed them to touch him, showed his crucifixion scars, and cooked breakfast for them. Fourth, there was early testimony with no time for a myth or a legend to develop. Fifth, following the resurrection, the disciples led exchanged lives, and they would not relent their belief in the resurrection on pain of death. If you had been there in those experiences, how would you have explained the dramatic change in the disciples' behavior? Some sort of powerful, transformative experience is required for them to switch from hiding in fear to bold, fearless witnesses of the resurrection. The truth of the risen Christ appearing to them had to be that dramatic experience. Do you have an alternative explanation for their dramatic change? If so, I'd like to hear it. I think there is no other explanation other than Jesus actually did rise from the dead. Sixth, the Christian churches exploded over the entire Mediterranean coastal area because of the disciples' testimony. How would you explain that spread of the gospel? In Acts 17, verse 6, the mob in Thessalonica gives their explanation Quotes, these men who have upset the world have come here also, end quotes. Seventh, extra-biblical accounts confirm the basic contours of the Christian story. 
Historian Gary Habermas lists 39 ancient sources outside the Bible providing more than 100 facts about Jesus' life, teachings, death, and resurrection. Allow me to close this episode by reminding you to exercise daily, walk with God. Thank you for listening to Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, a production of Wave 94 Radio in Tallahassee, Florida. If you have any questions or comments for Joe, please forward them to Doug Apple at Wave 94 at this email address, dougapple at wave94.com. And be sure to join us every Monday evening at 6.45 p.m. on Wave 94 and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, Defending and Commending the Faith, with Joe Mott.